Welcome to Digital Asset News, or Dan for short. My name is Rob, and today I want to just take a step back and take a look at the possibility that uh, maybe I'm a little bit too bearish and I could be wrong. Now, on this channel, uh, you may know that I have been uh, super bearish for quite some time. So we're just going to take a look at some possibilities uh, that are out there. So I just want to stress everybody to not be a thumbnail investor and look at the thumbnail and title go, whoop, Rob's wrong. Time to go sell my uh, kids, my kidneys, and my house and buy Bitcoin and everything else. It's not how it's going to work. So let's just break this down. The first thing we're going to do is talk about the bull case for Bitcoin and crypto. Then we're going to talk about uh, the staking video we did yesterday. And then lastly, and this is going to be the most important piece of this video. And it's all about the Stockdale paradox. Everything that we, we talk about is good information, but the last piece is probably the most important information I could put out. So stick around for that. And then lastly, we'll do a little Q&A. So let's just jump right in, shall we? So the first thing I want to talk about is this was a newsletter that came to me uh, yesterday. And it's from Philip. Philip Swift, who is the creator of a lot of the different charts that you see on Look Into Bitcoin. LookintoBitcoin.com is a great website. It, uh, it's 100% free. And they have high quality Bitcoin charts. Everything you really want to know. And uh, actually, I've reached out to Philip. He's supposed to be on the show at some point, whenever he's not too busy. But that's a whole other video. So the newsletter that came out, the first uh, couple sentences were pretty revealing. He says, uh, I continue to believe that the market will soon switch from selling traditional risk assets such as Bitcoin in a risk off environment. Right now, Bitcoin is seen as a uh, risk on to instead realizing that much of the risk, in fact, lies with the governments and their currencies. Now, the second part I could totally agree with, but the first part where people are going to switch off to see it as a uh, as a as a risk off asset. I was like, I don't believe it. I, I'm sorry. I just don't see it. But I was like, maybe I'm wrong. So I took a look at a couple of charts just to see what the price action has been. So Bitcoin, I mean, today is pretty flat. I think it's, well, it's over here. One hour, 0%, 24 hour, up 0.1%. Uh, seven days, it's down negative one and a half. And in 14 days, negative one. In 30 days, 3%. I was like, hmm, that is interesting because that doesn't seem too regularly volatile like we've seen with uh, the other markets. And I compared this to the S&P 500. And we can see right here that, again, over one day, s and is down to almost two and a half percent. Five day, negative one. All right. But one month, negative 7%. And of course, six months, negative 18. And one year, negative 20%. But this one month part, it's like things are, it's like things are slowing down for our correlation. Because in one month, the S&P is down seven and a half percent. In one month, Bitcoin is only down half less than half, 40% of what that is. And also take a look at <clears throat> NASDAQ and the same thing. In the last month, it's down almost 10%. Again, Bitcoin's only down negative two. So it's kind of odd that the, the, these things are just slowing down. So maybe the part that Philip talks about is right, but I further wanted to break it down. I took a look at uh, Ben's website, you know, the Cryptoverse. Links in the description, you can check it out. Now that one is not free, but it's totally worth it. And I took a look at, just so far, October, we're sucking. Let's be honest. Negative 1%, but <laughs> not as bad as traditional markets. And then September, which I thought was going to be much, much worse. Negative 2. And of course, August was awful. July, not bad. And of course, June was our worst month. Negative 38% and 15%. Take away June, which, was, which is what people call the bottom, which I don't believe. And we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but that's the worst month we could have had. Take that out. We're not doing too bad. So I jump back here and I think to myself, okay, well, what's your, what's your proof be besides that, Philip? And he first he talks about, we continue to hold the zone level A, which I'm not a TA person, but I can kind of figure this out, that uh, we're range bound, right? There's been some peaks and valleys, but since that uh, big dip in June, down to 17.4, 17.5, somewhere around there, we're pretty much moving sideways. So I'm like, well, that sounds pretty good. What else you got? And then down here, he talks about the fear and greed index, which let's be honest, uh, Everybody's still sharding their pants. Uh, we're in extreme fear, depending on who you are. I'm not. I, I see some more downside, but it's not like you know, I've been around. You've been around. If you're here watching this, you've been around for a while. So it's not like it's a big mystery about where things are going. And then uh, going down, 
there's a couple of things he talked about, which gives me some hope where I think to myself, maybe I was wrong about this bear market. And he talks about the NUPL, net unrealized profit and loss. And this is subtracting the realized cap by market cap. You're able to see the extent to which the market is holding profits or losses right now. When there's sustained periods of paper losses, we see major cycle lows being formed. As that happens, many participants capitulate as they feel disillusioned and quit the market at the worst possible time. I gotta tell you, if you're quitting right now, I mean, it's up to you, you know? I can't tell you what to do about your dad, I'm not a financial advisor, but I think this is like the, one of the worst times to quit. I could be wrong, maybe Bitcoin goes to zero. I'm just kidding, I don't think it's gonna do that. But the question then is, well, let's take a look at the NEPL and let's also take a look at who's holding because that gives us a little greater insight. So this is the NUPL. First of all, let's talk about what it is. It's derived from market value and realized value. Realized value uh, takes the price of each Bitcoin when it was last moved. So when you subtract the realized value from the market value, we get unrealized profits and loss. And that can tell us when there's a bottom. And we've, again, been pretty darn rage bound. That's why I like looking look at Bitcoin. Their charts, they're very simple. Like I'm a simpleton. I'm not very smart. And I like, I like colors. I like things that are simple. And this is very simple, right? I mean, we talk about what it is and we can see that in this euphoria green zone or greed zone, this would have been a pretty good time to sell around 19,326 in 2017. Also, uh, January 14th at 40,000 will be a pretty, pretty good time. And then of course to uh, accumulate, it's almost the same thing. We see it just going on sideways. So there's that part. That made me think again, like, well, who's holding, who's propping this up? Who's keeping us going? There's a great website. It's called Into the Block. It's very cheap. I don't have a link. I, I, have a, I, I don't even have an affiliate link or a link, but it's just into, into the block.com. And there's a couple of things to make mention of, which is this. The holders who are making money, who are in the money and out of the money. Well, in the money is still almost 50%, which is pretty amazing. And then out is 49%, which is a good, good amount. So I thought to myself, well, who's holding all this stuff? And then if we drill it down by time held, there's two, there's two ways to do it. Addresses by time held for Bitcoin and the balance by time held. Did you know, we talked about this on DCA show on Friday, that... Coming over here, probably can't see that that well. Okay. People who have held Bitcoin for a year or more, that's 30 million addresses. Those are called holders. They call them cruisers between one and 12 months, 14.79. And traders <clears throat> are less than one month. So what is the percentage of that? Check this out. People who have held Bitcoin a year or more are 63%. That's a lot. And they're just not selling. And the reason why I know they're not selling is because look over here, holders, one year plus, they've actually are the only group that's increased. They're up almost 2%. Cruisers, one in 12, traders down, I mean, 10% across the board if you really look at it like that way. And then also balance by time held. Holders, 13 million, percentage wise, same thing. 61, 33, and five. And again, well, holders are up, cruisers are up a little bit, but traders are down. So these are the ones that are propping it up. And if they haven't sold in this amount of time, my question is what's gonna cause them to sell? So there is that piece. And then there's also one more piece as far as a forecast tool, because this is gonna kind of tell us where we are as far as a bottom indicator. Now, don't put all your money into any chart, any one chart, look across the board. Try to get a little bit more depth. So this one here, there's two, there's two portions of it. There's the, the balance price and the CVDD. Real quick, the balance price is an on-chain indicator. It's trying to identify the lowest price that Bitcoin may drop in the future. It's calculated by subtracting transfer price from realized price. And then the CVDD is the cumulative value coin days destroyed. Again, you can look at all these, these charts for free and look into Bitcoin. There's a link in the description. It's not an affiliate link. Uh, they, they identify a value of sort to the UTXOs. Uh, they can be thought of as coins moving between wallets. That's really all it is. When coins are sent between wallets, the transaction has a value of, in dollars, plus it also destroys a time value in terms of how long. So the, coin, the value is coin days destroyed. CVDD tracks the cumulative sum as coins move from old hands into new hands, or really wallets. 
And the result is that it has historically correctly forecast the major lows of Bitcoin price with good accuracy. Again, I don't believe it. But as we take a look at it, I need to break this down for you. So we need to know one of the lows for the cycles. Thankfully, I created that. You can find this too, a link in the description. Here's the, the, the time lows for each cycle. Remember, cycle, everything starts with the Bitcoin halving. Bitcoin halving in 2012. 2013 was an all-time high. 2014 was a dip. 2015 was a reset. Then we went into uh, the next cycle, 16, 17, 18, 19, then 20, blah, blah, blah. So the, the high of the first cycle was 29th November 2013 with a price of around 11.27, depending on where you look. And then on January 2015, that was the low at 172, which was an 85% reduction. Okay, got that? So just remember this, January 2015, remember December 2018. That's all you gotta remember. January 2015, December 2018. January 2015, all right. So if we come over here, oops. See these two charts? This is CBDD, and this is the balance price. So you see where they kind of touch everything? So what is that? January, January 2015 is where they touched. And again, can you see another part where it, it, it touched again? Right over here. And that was in December 2018. It's amazing how I was able to, to not predict, but kind of forecast a little bit of where it's going. And now, if we look over here, we are so close. We're so close to it, just, just on, the, on the precipice of where it should be. So when we take a look at the balance price and the CBDD, it's around 15,900. And the price today is around 19,000. So 15,900, remember that. That's important. So again, I don't know where things are going, but maybe I was wrong when I thought that we were gonna drop to below 15. Maybe, you know, everybody's calling for like Bitcoin to go up. Well, some people are. I think those people are a little off, but whatever. And then a lot of people are calling for Bitcoin to go to 12K or 8K or some, some people said 3K. Gareth Salloway, I think, just said it's going to go to 3,000 at some point. Well, maybe. But maybe we're all wrong. Maybe instead of going up a little bit or down a lot of bit, maybe it's just somewhere around 15,9, 15, 15 16,000. I'm not for sure. But... I can tell you this, I think it is going to go a certain way. This is also from the block, it talks about volatility, which we just talked about, how not volatile Bitcoin actually is. It's actually less than 40% annualized volatility. This is based on their last 30 days of price action, has fallen below a key level. The last six times Bitcoin's volatility fell to 40% or below, Bitcoin's price moved over 20% in either direction within two to four weeks. Okay, so I know you're like, well, that doesn't help me because it goes in either direction. Well, it could go up or it could go down like everybody talks about. However, four out of six times, four out of six, uh, it went down. And then two out of six times or a third, it went up. So there's more of a chance of it going down than going up after the volatility becomes what it is. And then lastly, or almost last, is this little chart. This is the days since each cycle's Bitcoin having the cycle bottom. And uh, if you can see that, let me blow this up a little bit. So this red was the uh, 2013 cycle, like we talked about, 2012, 13, 14, 15, right? So the Bitcoin having was 2012, like we talked about. From the Bitcoin having to the cycle low, it was 779 days. In 2017, from the Bitcoin having in 2016, to the low in 2018, it was 891 days. So far, we have hit 886 days. And who knows if it was the low? I will say this. If you subtract the time that we have right now, what is it? October 16th, 17th, 16th, to first week of June, second week of June, somewhere around there. That's around, that's a minus 120 days. That would keep us to around 760 days or somewhere around there, which would be the same thing over here. So imagine if that was the low. If June was the low, that would match up almost perfectly with the first cycle. I just don't see it. I see how it's like, 
and correct me where I'm wrong here, maybe it's like this. It looks like those, th those times are increasing a little bit. So we've got 779 days in the first one, 891 days, roughly 100 more days, right? Well, what if another 100 days on top of 891, now we're around a, a we're at a specifically 991 days, around 1,000 days. And wouldn't that kind of correspond to the downside? But wouldn't it also kind of correspond to maybe where we're going here? Again, I don't know exactly where things are going, but uh, this is the things that I see. And there's just a couple of things that, that concern me. Remember that the things we talk about here, everything's in a bubble. I mean, I can't predict everything. I mean, God knows I did a price prediction video and those are way off. Although I did get Cardano right and Theta and Chainlink, but I did screw up on the Bitcoin, Ethereum, VGX token, let's be honest. So when I talk about these things, it's all if everything kind of stays the same, even with, the, with uh, things that are going on in the world. If there's a black swan event, if, I don't know, tactical nuclear warheads are using the crane, if the Bank of England collapses, if the bond market collapses, if we see another potential outbreak of, of, of some pandemic, or who knows what it is, the black swan event happens, all that stuff we just talked about out the window, right? If there's a nuclear war, no one's holding on to Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't, I don't think, well, maybe they will, but uh, they probably sell a little bit just to make sure they're okay, right? But on the flip side of that, and this goes right back to what Philip said in this very first paragraph, I continue to believe the market will soon switch from selling traditional risk assets such as a Bitcoin in a risk-off environment as people realize that there's so much risk in governments and their currencies. There are so many people that are getting into the space. I mean, these are not like small people, like the Black Rocks, like the Mass Mutuals, you know, those, those big, NY Mellon, the oldest bank in the, in the US, is uh, providing custody with their trillions of assets under management. I mean, add them all up, that's over 20 trillion assets under management right there. So we're all in here. How long is it before these organizations say, you know what, there's an asymmetrical upside. We've got a market cap of under a trillion. For Pete's sakes, Apple is at 2.2 trillion, one company. So maybe they're like, maybe that's the reason for the slowdown. I, I, I can't tell you. But it always makes it comes back to this, this chart. Every one of these squares is $100 billion. And this is in 2020, mind you. So it's a little bit outdated. Wish they'd update it. But the Fed's balance sheet back then was $7 trillion. Now it's $9 trillion or $8.9 trillion. Billionaires, all these guys, they got $8 trillion. <laughs> which is ridiculous, $8 trillion. Gold has a market cap of 12 trillion now. Stock markets is over 100 trillion. The money supply is 35 trillion. Global debt, 253 trillion. Global real estate, 280 trillion. Wealth, 360 trillion in derivatives, you know, a quadrillion. So just take a couple of these squares and stick them into crypto and digital assets. I always look at this and go, this is, I can understand why the bigger institutions are getting in. But I just don't understand the thought process of traditional markets. Probably just safer. But again, uh, I could be wrong. I think the big thing that's preventing them is uh, regulation, so they don't get uh, rug pulled like like Mark Cuban keeps doing, or keeps getting down to him. Don't sue me. And uh, that's what's going on. So uh, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. Now let's move on just real quick uh, to staking. We did a video yesterday. Uh, it's up right now. It's it was. I think one of the most one requested for staking, which was Polkadot. A little bit longer one, uh, but I show you how to use the ledger, how to take things off uh, of the exchanges, and how you can use Polkadot to stake it for, I mean, a good amount, 11.9 or 12.9% APY. It's pretty good. I mean, pretty good for if you own Polkadot, just let you know. Also, uh, just so you know, I want to thank uh, iTrust for sponsoring the videos. That's right. And they are doing... Um, polka dot staking. So as you all know, I am super biased when I talk about the things that I use and, and all that stuff. So I've been using iTrust for two years. And the reason why is because I don't want to pay a lot of taxes in, uh, in the US. And for Roth IRAs, this is how Peter Thiel, this is how he turned 2000 bucks into $5 billion with a Roth IRA. You want to know what I'm talking about? Uh, there's a link in the description. It looks just like this. And uh, I'd go over that story and why I use Roth IRAs through iTrust. And that's it. So hope that makes sense. And then lastly, like I wanted to, I, I told you in the beginning, 
all the stuff we just talked about was, it was nice, it was good to know, a lot of theories. But this part right here is the mental aspect I need you to understand. And it's called the Stockdale Paradox. And I need you to balance between the reality or the brutal reality we're going through right now to the crazy optimism I see so much in other YouTube channels. There's nothing wrong with hopium, but it's when there's uncorrelated hopium that it's just, it's just exhausting. And um, I'm just gonna show you what I'm talking about. There is a book by Jim Collins, Good to Great. And he took a look at uh, Jim Stockdale. And I'm going to have him explain to you. This is about two minutes long. And I think this is going to make perfect sense when you hear it as far as like investing in the hopium and the brutal realities and just to where you want to be. So just take a listen. Hold on. All right. There we go. I would like to give you a way of thinking that has been enormously helpful to me that came from the good to great research for dealing with great difficulty. And it was what we came to call the Stockdale Paradox. The Stockdale Paradox was taught to us by, when we were doing the good to great research, we are trying to make sense of the CEOs. And, and in doing that, I just by chance happened to get to know Admiral Jim Stockdale, who was the highest ranking military officer in the Hanoi Hilton, shot down in 1967, was there till 1974. They could pull him out at any time and torture him, and they did. They tortured over 20 times. And I had the privilege to get to know Admiral Stockdale. And uh, we were going to the faculty club one day, and I had uh, read his book in Love and War, which was written in alternating chapters by himself and his wife about their years when he was in the camp. And I got depressed reading the book because it seemed so bleak. It seemed so difficult. It seemed, you know, it's like we can all endure anything if we know it's going to come to an end and we know when. But what if you don't know if it's ever going to come to an end? And you certainly don't know when. So I asked Admiral Stockdale how he dealt with that. And he said, you have to realize I never got depressed because I never, ever wavered in my faith that not only I would get out, but I would turn being in the camp into the defining event of my life that in retrospect, I would not trade. Later, when we were up the hill, I asked him, I said, Admiral Stockdale, who didn't make it out as strong as you? And he said, easy, it was the optimist. I said, the optimist? You sounded optimistic. He said, no, I was not optimistic. I never wavered in my faith that I would prevail in the end, but I was not optimistic. I said, what's the difference? Well, the optimist always thought we'd be out by Christmas. Of course, Christmas would come and it would go. And then we were going to be out by Easter and Thanksgiving, and then Christmas would come again, and they died of a broken heart. And that's when Admiral Stockdale grabbed me by the shoulders and said, this is what I learned. When you're facing, in, you're imprisoned by great calamity, by great difficulty, by great uncertainty, you have to, on the one hand, never confuse the need for unwavering faith that you will find a way to prevail in the end with, on the other hand, the discipline to confront the most brutal facts we actually face. And we're not getting out of here by Christmas. We are not getting out of here by Christmas, everybody. I hate to tell you that, but that's just the truth. And doesn't that sound a lot like some of the things that we go through, especially with constant hopium? out there that Bitcoin's going to blah, 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 and there's a market cap and da, da, da. That's the ones that's crushing. That was the one that crushed me in 2018 when I was like, well, I know it's going down, but it'll go back up. And everybody's like, it's going to come back up. It's going to come back up. And they were right, but they were given like time frames that were like ridiculous. That's the big thing. I can't tell you the time frames. I can't tell you exactly where things are going. I can't tell you, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. But I can take a look at it and go, Bull markets don't last forever. We saw that. And neither do bear markets. So when I take a look at these things, I just think to myself, it's not a time frame. I don't know the time frames. But I can tell you that I can kind of give an assumption of where things might potentially go. Again, 
things like this, these charts, anything I just showed you, they sound good, but I don't know exactly when. So like 2012, 2015, having the all-time high dip resets, same thing in the 16 and 19. I think this is what's going to happen, but what if it doesn't? What if the next bull run is 2023 and I miss it and I, I keep waiting and waiting and waiting? I don't think that's the right option for me. Uh, I did a video. You can go to Dan Teaches Crypto, 100% free. And I talked about exactly what I'm going to get out. Most of it's dealt with uh, charts, bicycle cycle tops, and UPLs and things like that. But what if it doesn't? What if we go to 2025, 2026, 2027, and we have to go that route? In my mind, and this is going to be very popular, but it's the truth, just like what they talked about with Jim Stockdale, and there's a big difference between investing and worrying about investing as opposed to getting tortured in an imprisonment camp, uh, the Hanai Hotel. So I kind of take it as a perspective, like things aren't that bad. But if I take a look at it and go, I don't know when things are going to happen. Good things will happen. It just takes time, and I can't tell you when. But that's why DCA and just stick around. Anyhow, so that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. And that concludes today for the news. If you got to get out of here, it's been 26 minutes. It was a long one today. So, uh, but I think it was some decent information. If you want to stick around, we're going to do Q&A. And we're going to do that right now. And I'll answer all your burning questions to the best of my abilities as we go over Q&A. And last thing to note is that we did the polka dot video on staking. We've done Cardano. We've done um, Avalanche. The next ones will be uh, Cosmos or Atom and Near Protocol. And I've been using the Ledger for all of those staking opportunities, and it's by far the best experience. All right, so that's it for right now. So we got to get out of here. Thumbs up, subscribe, all that good stuff. Now let's get into the Q&A.